This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. On that date. <clears throat> Ask the Chassam Soifer, wait a second. Why in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash were, were, were there no confusion? They knew exactly what day the walls were breached. Why was there only confusion in the times of Bayis Rishon and there's no confusion in the times of Bayis Sheni? Says the Chassam Soifer, very simple. Who ordained Shiva Asabatamos in the times of the second Beis HaMikdash? Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the God of Adar. Where was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai? He fled to save his own skin. So if the God of Adar fled to save his own skin, the God of Adar is not Pitsar. If the God of Adar is not Pitsar, there's no confusion, and they knew exactly what date it happened. Says the Chsam Soifer in the times of the first base Hamikdash, who was the leader? Yirmiyah Hanavi. Where was Yirmiyah with the people? He was incarcerated in jail. Yirmiyah didn't know what date it was. He was Bitsar. He was in turmoil. So this age-old Machloikes between the communities of Prague and the communities of Frankfurt actually dates back to Chorben Bayes Rishon and Chorben Bayes Sheni. Perhaps on a different occasion, I'm going to speak about it later today, Chassam Soifer traces it back to a Machloikes Midrashim. Be it as it may, Chassam Soifer writes, Lahachria eneni kedai. I am not capable of paskening definitively what is the correct thing for the Rav to do under those circumstances. But as we mentioned, Rav David Kahana Shapiro, Rav Shimshon Stockhammer, and Rav Menachem Zemba, they paskened that they're going to go down with the people. And Rabbi Zon mentioned to me that it's almost impossible to understand. Why would they stay with the people? What could they offer the people? The Warsaw Ghetto was about to be a bombed, destroyed. You know what the Germans did? They came, they set on fire all the gas heaters, they sent on fire all the gas lines, they poured gasoline on every home, and they bombed the homes one by one by one. And they raised the Warsaw Ghetto. Of what benefit would it be to the people to have these three Gedoylem in their midst? Now I'm going to speak out now, this is the first time I'm talking about it. This is a point of considerable historical and halakha controversy about people who argue what happened. I'm going to tell you what my grandfather said happened. My grandfather told me that Rav Menachem Zemba paskined repeatedly and emphatically to give sanction to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Rav Menachem Zemba paskined that the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was an act of Kiddush Hashem. We have a record that Rav Menachem Zemba said, "Umi tamze ani roya shalafi hahalacha mitzvah hamered b'meitav tachsise hamolchama." That it's a mitzvah for Jews to arm themselves and fight back. Kiddush Hashem yeshkan mochemes mitzvahi. My grandfather was a ben bayis by Rav Menachem Zemba, and he was appointed to be a lookout during the Orso Ghetto uprising. He had very good vision. He never wore glasses. He said the hardest thing about turning 100 years old is that the Rashi Oisiyos are a little bit more difficult to see. In the book, Men of Distinction, it's recorded that Rav Nachem Zemba said, I speak to you from the depths of my conscience. There's only one way for us. Revolt. Resist. Every able-bodied man. Melchem Mitzvah. Radzina Rebbe, Paskin, to rebel. Radzina Rebbe instructed his Hasidim to rebel and join the partisans. There was a tainness declared in Lublin, and the Radzina Rebbe organized a rebellion, and the Nazis learned about it, and they, as we mentioned earlier, they said either the Rebbe turns himself in, or we wipe out the forest. The Gabai did not tell the Radzina Rebbe. Instead, the Gabai dressed up as a Radzina Rebbe, and presented himself to the Nazis. He was killed immediately, Later, the Nazis found out what happened, and the Rebbe was forced to present himself. They tortured him. And in the dying words of Radzina Rebbe, he cried out, Revolt! Rebel! Don't surrender! Shema Yisrael! There was a Rav, Rav Zemelman, who actively participated in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. He snuck out, he disguised himself as an Aryan, he procured uh, weapons, he smuggled them back into the ghetto, and he trained the young men to fight against the Nazis. Rav Tzvi Hersh Meisel, Shaos 
Mekad Shei Hashem. He paskins, we need to rebel. My grandfather writes, the Warsaw Jews carried out their uprising for six weeks in a holdout without parallel in history. Never in the sad and holy annals of Jewish history did anyone survive for his faith, did a more desperately glorious stand have ever been made than by those heroes who acted not only to save their own lives, but to save the dignity of the entire Jewish people. They fought like mythological lions, without arms, without help, and without any hope. What, was the, what were the fate of these three Rabbanim? Rab Shimshin Stockhammer, well, he was taken out of the ghetto. He was taken to a labor camp near Lublin. He lost his entire family in the death camps. Pesach, 1944. Rav Shimshin Stockhammer, a broken man, an ill man. He managed to bake matzos in the labor camp together with a certain doctor. They were smuggling the matzos out on their bodies. They were caught and they were beaten ruthlessly. Twelve months later, Pesach 1945, and if you know the, the history, very soon will be liberation. Pesach 1945. Rav Stockhammer was taken to another camp in southern Germany, near Italy. Rav Stockhammer is gravely ill, and he made the following announcement, I will not be eating chametz for eight days, meaning I will not be eating for eight days. His Talmidim said, Rebbe, you're going to die. You're not going to eat for eight days? That's not the halacha. The halacha is v'chai bohem. Rav Stockhammer said, I know the halacha. But there are 2,500 Jews in this camp. One Yid needs to stand up and show the world that there's a Torah. And that's me. And I've been Mekabalit B'Yahava U'V'Simcha. For eight days, Rav Shimshin Stockhammer, one of the three Dayanim who convened on that Bezdin, two years later, survived miraculously. He did not eat for eight days. The war is about to be over. The Nazis rounded the entire camp up, headed west. Rav Stockhammer was on the train. The Americans were coming. His train was bombed. And Rav Shimshin Stockhammer was critically wounded. And he died on the 13th day of ER, three days before liberation. So what exactly were Rav Nachem Zemba and Rav Stockhammer, and Rav David Kahana Shapiro, why did they paskin that they should stay? What were they adding? What were they offering? What was their contribution? And Rabbi Zon told me that he heard a story that my grandfather wrote, and then he finally understood the psak, the historic psak, of these three great Go'inim. Let me read to you. We were hauled to the forced labor camp in Bidzin. We labored there under the most brutal conditions. In the early morning darkness, in the freezing temperatures of the bitter winter, we performed back-breaking labor under constant whippings. What provided us the secret, mysterious strength and endurance to continue breathing? My grandfather writes, Lule soyroscha shashuai ozavadati ba'onyi. If not for the torch of Torah that aided me, I would have succumbed to my sufferings. We stood on those abysmal nights together with the great Rabbanim of Warsaw, Rav David Kahana Shapiro, Rav Shimshin Stockhammer, and other Goinim who were able to say over the Gemara, Baalpeh, B'machashakim, Hoishivani, Zet, Talmud Bavli. It was the Shaklavataria of the Gemara that these precious Jews remembered by heart that was the eternal light to illuminate our hopeless, downtrodden hearts. And that's what gave us the ability to have a vision for a brighter future. This gives us a little bit of a deeper insight into why these Gedolim felt they could not forsake the people. 
It was the Torah that they were able to teach under the most desperate conditions. It was able to impart and illuminate the souls of these Yidin, infusing them with otherworldly strength. And ultimately then, it's not an overstatement to say that my grandfather was able to survive the war because of that courageous decision of Rav David Kahana Shapiro, Rav Shimshin Stockhammer, and Rav Menachem Zemba. And if that's the case, I think it's pretty accurate to say that if it was their encouragement that allowed him to survive, then if not for that decision of Das Torah 74 years ago, I too would not be here today. These Ga'inim had the foresight that the way a Yid survives the Golos is Belimad HaTorah. So to be machriya and to say definitively what is the correct thing to, for a Gadol to do? To stay with the people or to save their own life and rebuild? It is an impossible decision to make. It's a call only a Gadol Yisrael could make. Perhaps all we are able to say is Eilu ve'elu divrei le'kim chayim. Klal Yisrael today has been built and resuscitated both through the Gedolim and Admirim who took the opportunity to escape and rebuild their yeshivas and rebuild their courts and their chasidos. But we may equally say that the continuity of Klal Yisrael and the rebirth of Klal Yisrael stands on the legacy of Mesir Nefesh of these Go'inei Oilam, true Manhige Yisrael, who with abandonment gave up their lives, gave up their families, gave up their future to provide comfort and strength and hope for Yidin in the darkest moments of our Golos. And they were able to provide a brilliant light for the future generations of Klal Yisrael, who until this day bask in their nobility of character of these eternal luminaries. So after about 70 years, my brother Ari found a document. He found a manuscript that my grandfather wrote in the 50s that he submitted to Yad Vashem about the death march that he was on from Hasenthal in April 1945. While 99% of the Jews had already been liberated, my grandfather was one of the last camps, I believe the very last camp to be liberated. It's called the March from Hasenthal. And he describes how there are 700 prisoners, the last 700 Yidin in the Holocaust. And they're marching. 200 were deathly ill. Deathly ill means goisesim. Ridden with typhus. And we were deadly tired, wild from hunger, chased over icy mounds. If you didn't move fast, the bullet freed you from the march. And my grandfather writes, you could hear voices crying, bidding farewell. I cannot go on. Here's where I shall fall. Yeah, the, Here's where I shall fall. I wish I were in Eretz Yisrael. No one grieved after these people. No one said Kaddish after them. All we knew is the, dark, the night was still very dark and very long and the bullets were still in abundance. Do you remember the prophecy of the Navi Yechezkel? The Navi Yechezkel is walking in the valley of the dry bones. Walking in the dry bones. And he sees thousands of dry bones. And what does the Navi Yechezkel say? Will these dry bones come to life? And the Gemara in Sanhedrin, Sadi Beis, discusses who exactly were these dry bones that Yechezkel saw in his Navua. And the Gemara brings different opinions. And my grandfather writes that on this fateful death march, he has a vision of Yechezkel Hanavi witnessing the dry bones. And Yechezkel Hanavi is saying, Will the dry bones come to life? But friends, these bones have come to life. Those Yidin, 1945, who are living corpses, who are dry bones, Klal Yisrael has had a tchiyas hamisim. 
The Rebbe Shem has showered us with the Talat Chia, with the dew of resurrection. And there's been a renaissance and revival of Jewish life all over the world. But Marv Rabbi we still hope for the ultimate Chia Samesim, Shubi Zoycha, Baharamas Karen HaToyra, Baharamas Karen Yisrael, Viasko El Tzedek, Meher Amen. According to Minog Ashkenaz, there are 45 kinnas that are part of the liturgy of the Tisha B'Av service. Many of the kinnas are very difficult to understand. Their structure, their language is very complex. The Torah writes in Simon Tov Kufnon Tes that everyone in the congregation needs to understand the kinnas, including the women and the children and the young boys. And therefore, as every year, for the sake of greater understanding, and to the enhance the meaning of our Tisha of service, we're going to be selecting specific kinnas to recite, to focus on, paying attention to historical background, and to some of the key phrases. But let's just point out that even if one does not understand the words of kinnas, the words themselves carry tremendous meaning. Perhaps the most well-known of all the Paitanim, perhaps the most well-known of all the authors of kinnas was Rabbi Lazar HaKalir, universally accepted as the father of the Paitanim. The first 15 kinnas that we say this morning were written by Rabbi Lazar HaKalir. Says the Shiboy Leihaleket, that he heard from his father, who heard from his Rabbeim, that when Rabbi Lazar HaKalir would write the Piyutim, a fire came down from Shamayim and encircled him. Mahari Hertz writes that when Rabbi Lazar HaKalir wanted to compose the Piyutim, he would say the name of God, he would go up to Shamayim, he would ask the Malachim how to compose the Piyutim. The Malachim say, you write Piyutim based on the order of the Aleph Beis. And that is the formula that Rabbi Lezer HaKalir would use. There's a great degree of uncertainty. Who exactly is Rabbi Lezer HaKalir? It's Machlech Yisrishayinim, Toysis and Chagiga Yud Gimel, identifies him as none other than the son of Rabbi Shem Bar Yechai. Rabbi Lezer, Rabbi Shimon. The Rajva in the Tshuva Simen Tav Samachtes says this is Rabbi Lezer ben Arach. But even if a person is not familiar with the meaning and the translation of the words, every word of Kinos is Kodesh Kadoshim and has tremendous Kayach and power. We begin with Kinavav, Shavas. Shavas, which is uh, from the Pasuk, Shavas Mesois Libenu, which was written by Rabbi Lezer HaKalir, explains the psychological dimension of what we are mourning on Tisha B'av. Says Rabbi Lezer HaKalir, you see, psychologically, if a person has an intuition that disaster is coming, that prepares a person to be able to deal with the coming disaster. But the tsar of the Chorben, the pain of the Chorben, was not only that it happened, but that it happened suddenly. That people had no time to prepare themselves. They were not emotionally equipped to deal with the suddenness of the tragedy. One day they're in the Beis HaMikdash. One day they're Makriv Karbanois. One day they're being Oile Regal and they woke up in the morning and it's gone. Yirmiya too experienced the suddenness of the Chorben. Hashem told Yirmiya, go to Anasais, go to buy a field from your uncle. He went to Anasais. He returns in the morning and Yirmiya couldn't believe it. Where is the column of smoke that would ascend from the Mokam HaMizbeach? Yirmiya too experienced the suddenness of the Chorben. If you take a look at the eighth line, Eini chiksa lechazoin ben Berachia. My eye longs for the vision of Zechariah, the son of Berachia. The Navi Zechariah said in Parak Ches, Oid yeshvu zekenim uzekenois, berchoivos yushalayim. That one day elderly men and women will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with a staff from advanced age. And the streets will be filled with young boys and girls playing in the streets. The Kino says, We wait eagerly to see the fulfillment of the vision of Zechariah. You look on the 13th line, and we'll conclude with this. It says, Al Pnei Peras Nuftzu Chasideha. On the Euphrates River, her pious ones were mutilated. This refers to when the Jewish people were being exiled to Babel by Nebuchadnezzar, 
And Nebuchadnezzar sees the well-known Levium, the well-known singers, and Nebuchadnezzar turns to Levium and he says, Shiru lanu Sing to us the songs of Zion. Serenade us as we gloat over our victory. Whereupon the Levium in defiance took their instruments, hung them on the Arava tree, and took their thumbs and mutilated their thumbs, and they declared, Not we will not sing to you, but Eich no shir ashir Hashem al admas nechar. How can we sing on foreign soil? So I'll tell you a little secret. Generally, it's accepted that uh, the Levium did an admirable thing. They were moiser nefesh, not to sing for Nebuchadnezzar. Let me add an idea. If you look in Yevamos and Pevav, the Gemara is discussing that when Ezra came up from Bavel, it says, Umnei Levi Sham. I didn't find any Levium, and therefore we all know Ezra Kanas the Levium, that he took away my Sarishan from the Levium and he gave it to the Kayhanim. So Taisus asks, There are no Levium that went up to Eretz Yisrael? So Taisus says, That's right. There were no young Levium. The new generation did not return to Eretz Yisrael. There were only Levium 83 years and up, who were 13 years old at the time of the Chorban, spent 70 years in Babel, and they were the only Levium to return, but they didn't have any thumbs, because they all bit off their thumbs. So there was no one to play music in the Beis HaMikdash, and because of that, the Levium were penalized. As Reb Chaim Zaychik, that's how we reward the Levium. They bite off their thumbs in an act of self-sacrifice not to play music for Nebuchadnezzar and they're rewarded by having my Sarishan taken away from them. They should have been rewarded, not punished. Says Rav Chaim Zaychik, the Levim were wrong. They should not have bit off their thumbs. Why not? Because biting off their thumbs indicated that they were going into Golos and they would never see a Beis HaMikdash again and they would never play music again. And as remote of the possibility was, a Yid is never allowed to give hope, give up hope. They should have had a Muna that somehow, some way, they would make a return and play music again. And because they didn't have faith, they were penalized that they would never get again my Sarishain because a Yid never gives up hope. Kinavav Shavasru Manishimuni Avrai. Kino Yid Aleph. This is the single most important kinah that we say on Tisha B'av. And the reason is the recitation of this kinah was ordained by the Navi Yirmiya himself. The Pasuk in Devar Yom and Beis, Parak Lamed Hay says, And Yirmiya lamented That all the male singers, all the female singers, mentioned Yoshiahu in their lament until this day, Vayitneim l'choyk al Yisrael, and they made a law, they made a halacha. That whenever the Jewish people mourn, they must mention the death of Yoshio HaMelech. The reason why the death of Yoshio HaMelech was the most tragic death in the history of the Jewish people is because never had an individual brought about such a national-wide tshuva movement as Yoshiahu did. The Navi says, V'chamoyhu lo'ilafan of Melech, Asher Shaval Hashem, Bechal Avavoy, Uvechal Navshoy, Uvechal Maoidoy, Kechal Tairas Moisha. We talk about Shuva movements. The first and greatest Shuva movement was created by Yosho HaMelech. The Pasuk says, if you look on the sixth line in the Kinna, Gam Bechal, Malchay Yisrael Asher Kamu Ligdar. Even among all the Jewish kings that stood up to create fences around the Torah, like Kam Kamayu, Mimaisa Avigdar. Nobody stood up like Yoshiahu, like Avigdar. Who's Avigdar? Moshe Rabbeinu. He was Avi Kol Hagoydrim Shabbatayra. Yoshiahu's grandfather was Menashe, who committed the early reign, his early reign, to strip the Jewish people of every vestige of belief in Hashem. He planted idols in every corner of Eretz Yisrael, including the Kodesh Hakadoshim. At the end of Menashe's life, he did tshuva, but it was too late. Idolatry was so deeply rooted in the Jewish people, it was impossible to uproot. Manasseh's son Amoin continued his practices until he was assassinated by the palace guards after two years, leaving over an eight-year-old boy, Yoshio HaMelech, the new king of Israel. Now if you look in the Kinnah, 
On the third line, the, it says, Ben Shmoina Shana Hecha Lidroy Shmeyalaikov, that he was eight years old when he began to seek out God. It's not literal. What it means is as follows. If you look in Divrei Hayom and Beis, it says he was eight years old when he became the king. And the Gemara says in Yuma and Chaf Beis that a king is considered Kekaten Shinoi Ladami. So eight years into his reign, he began to seek out God. That's what the Kinnah means, that he was eight years old when he began to seek out Hashem. The eighth year of his reign. In the 18th year of Yeshua's reign, Something that happened that would f- change the face of Israel for all eternity, and that is the Kayan Gadol Chilkiyahu, who happened to be the father of Yirmiya Hanavi, made long overdue repairs on the Beis Hamikdash, and in the course of his work, Chilkiyahu discovered a Torah scroll that had been hidden since the time of the king Achaz, the father of Chizkiyahu. Now, this is a very important point. If you look in your English Kinnis, you will see something which is the influence of Christian Bible scholars, which is not true. And that is, most English kinnas say that what was so startling was the fact that they found a Sefer Torah and that a Sefer Torah had not been seen in Klal Yisrael for 18 years. Yes, that is the belief of the Christian religion. However, that is not true and that is not what we believe. We believe there was never any interruption in our Messiah. This is the opinion of the Radak, and I heard this from Rav Miller many times. What was significant was not that they found the Sefer Torah. What, what, what was significant was which Sefer Torah they found. They found the Sefer Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu. What was significant was not the found, fact that they found the Torah, but where the Torah was open to. It was open to Mishnah Torah. It was the Sefer Torah of Moshe in his own handwriting, open to the Toichacha that says, Yoylech Hashem Oyschav Yes Malkacha. That God will not only take revenge against the people, He'll take revenge against the king. And the Pasuk says, Oror Asher Lo Yokum Es Divrei HaToyra Hazois. Whereupon Yoshiyahu Chapt Pachad, and he said, In that case, if the curse will be on me, and I will be carried away, says Yushalmi and Soita, Aleinu lehakim. We must uphold the Torah. And he went into motion and he convened a tremendous assembly that Klai Yisrael needs to pledge their allegiance to the Torah, b'chol levo, b'chol nefesh. He sent detectives into everyone's home to see if they had filters, to see, I mean, if they had Abed Zara. And they had a double door system with the image of the idol on the back of their doors. So that when the detectives came in, the unfiltered Avodah Zara was hidden behind the door. And they didn't discover anything. So Yoshiahu naively believed that there was no Avodah Zara in Kali So when he gets word from Parai Nechai, Parai the Lame, Egypt of course was southwest of Israel. He wants safe passageway to the northeast, to Assyria. He says, we will not attack. We just want to walk through your land. Yoshio refused on the grounds that the Torah promises that when the Jewish people do the will of God, no nation will pass through even for uh, peaceful means. And therefore, naively believing that the Jewish people were were clean of Avodah Zarah, he refused. Yermia sent word to Yoshio, you're wrong. You cannot refuse passageway. The Jewish people are not as clean of Avodah Zarah that you think. And Yoshio made the following tragic mistake, which I believe is the number one mistake that is made today by people. And that is Yoshio said, let me ask a different rabbi. And he asked Chulda Hanaviyah. And Chulda Hanaviyah said, you could refuse. Chulda Hanaviyah bin Nevuah had a more sympathetic take on it. And Yoshiahu made the mistake of not listening to the more in touch, the more connected God of Israel, which is the major mistake of our generation. People say, yeah, I asked the Rav, I asked the Rabbi, who did you ask? Not all Rabbanim are equal. You could only follow the Psaq of somebody who's a Paisek Adar or who goes to a Paisek Adar. You can't just ask anybody. If that rabbi is making a mistake, the Pesachet Tshuva writes, you're amazed. You can't just ask somebody. And that was the mistake of Yeshua Melech. He asked Chulda Hanaviyah. 
But he didn't ask Yirmiyahu. Yoshiyahu denied Paro passageway. Paro he went to war against Yoshiyahu. And the Kino describes how the Egyptian archers made him Samua Kematar Lachitzim. They made him like target practice. They shot him with 300 arrows and the blood came out of his body. Pulled out of his body. I'll leave you with a question, but uh, too much pilpal we can't do. I'll leave you with a question to think about. So Yermio comes to bury the dam. How could he bury the dam? Dam is Tamei Yermio Zakayin. He's not a mace mitzvah. There are many other soldiers around. Anyway, Yoshiahu's tragic, untimely death was the beginning of the end of Kal Yisrael. And it is this kinnis which is considered the central kinnis of the Tisha B'Av service. Kina Tazayin. Zuchar Asher Asot Tsar Bifnim. The Kina describes the unspeakable acts that the wicked Titus perpetrated when he entered the Kaidash HaKadoshim. Of course, uh, Titus was a Roman emperor who destroyed the second Mesa Mikdash. Actually, the siege began, was began by Vespasian, Aspasianus Caesar, but when he was appointed the emperor of Rome, so he appointed his son Titus to continue the siege. It says Gemar and Gittin and Vav Bez that Titus began his siege not only with a statement an arrogant declaration against the Jewish people, but his declaration was hurled against God Himself. Says the Gemara, he declared, Where is God? And in unparalleled defiance, he came into the Makam HaMizbeach, and he pounded, he kicked the Mizbeach, and he said, Lucas, Lucas, wolf, wolf, I'm a king, you're a king. Let's take this one outside. The Gemara relates that Titus grabbed the Zoyna, took her into the Kodesh HaKadoshim, spread out a Sefer Torah, and in the Kodesh HaKadoshim, on a Sefer Torah, he committed the unspeakable Avera. He then slashes the Paroiches. God made a miracle, the blood flows out of the Paroiches. Titus thought he actually had slain God. He makes the Paroiches a bundle and carries out all the Kalim of the Beis HaMikdash. By the account of Josephus, 97,000 Jews were taken captive and the death toll was 1.1 million. The Romans minted a special coin. On one side of the coin is garlanded with a victory wreath, a picture of Vespasian, and on the reverse side there's a forlorn Jew who weeps under a palm tree. The inscription reads, Judea capta, don't pay attention to what it says on the bottom of the kinnos. That's not what it means. Judea capta does not mean Judah's captive. It means capta in Latin, caput. They're done. They're finished. I want to point out two important hashkafas that we see from this kinnos. The Mekoyin laments that when Aaron HaKoyin, when his sons, Nadav Aviu, brought an Eish Zara into the Kodesh, into the Mishkan, these two holy tzaddikim were punished that a fire emanated from heaven, burst forth, entered their nostrils, consumed their innards, and they died instantaneously. And yet the wicked Titus takes a Sefer Torah, takes a Zoyna, commits the unspeakable in the Kodesh HaKadoshim, and nothing happened to him. If you look on the bottom line, our forefathers, Nadav and Aviu, when they brought a foreign fire, they were consumed in fire. And yet, And Titus commits the unspeakable, and nothing happened. How do we understand that? How do we explain that? It says, Nefesh HaChayim, very simple. Goyim can't do anything. The acts of a Gentile have no ramifications in the world. It is worse for a Jew to entertain an immodest thought than for Titus to take a Zoyna into the Kodesh HaKadoshim and be Mazana on the Sefer Torah. Because Titus is just a puppet. Titus is a boss of Adam. What could he do to defile Kedusha? But a Yid is programmed into all the Oilamais. A Yid is programmed into every detail of creation. An improper thought of a Yid has more contamination to the world than the worst un- unspeakable acts of Tito Sarasha. This is the point that the Kinnah is emphasizing. As for Baizik Shah, 
Why would God make a miracle that when Titus pierces the Parechas, blood would come out? What's Hashem trying to accomplish? He wants Titus to think that Titus killed the Rebbe Nisham Kaviyachal. Why would Hashem do that? Hashem doesn't make a miracle for nothing. What lesson was Rebbe Nisham teaching us? Says Rabbi Isaac Sher, the blood that came out of the Parochas is the central lesson of Chorben Beis HaMikdash. Don't think that life today as a Jew is pretty good. That we wake up in the morning and we put on talis and tefillin and we learn every morning and every night and Judaism is thriving and flourishing. Don't make that mistake. Says Rabbi Isaac Sher, we are dead A Jew today is dead. We have no spiritual life. God created the blood to flow out of the Parechas to indicate that upon the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, the Jewish people have suffered cardiac arrest. Our lifeblood has flown out. We say, Rachem al Tzion, Kihi Beis Chayenu. Our life house is Tzion, and if we don't have Tzion, we have no physical life, we have no spiritual life. The Gra writes, that the majority of the Torah was lost with the Chorban Beis HaMikdash. Our connection to Hashem has been severed. The lesson of the blood indicates that upon the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, the Jewish people has suffered cardiac arrest. Kino tezayin zuchar sha'asit sa'adifnim. Kino chafalif arzei halvanayin. One of the most dramatic highlights of the Tisha B'Av service, Kino chafalif, depicting the murder of the Asar Ruge Malchus. The ten martyrs, the ten great Tanoim who were murdered by the Romans. This kina is not meant as a precise historical account, as these ten Sadiqim did not leave at the same time. In fact, Rabbi Shimon Gamliel and Rabbi Shmuel Kain Gadol never even saw the other eight Tanoim. The purpose of the Piyot is to evoke the emotion and the feeling for the Chorben. On Yom Kippur, we also say a Piyot for the Asara Haruge Malchus, the Ela Ezkara. The reason we say it on Yom Kippur is because Yom Kippur is a day of Kapara and the Gemara says in Rosh Hashanah, Amar Rabami, Lama Nismacha, Misas Miriam, Lepara Aduma, Loimar Lach Ma Para Aduma, Mechaperes, Av Misas Tzadikim Mechaperes. But the question is, why do we read about the deaths of these Tzadikim on Tisha B'Av? They were not killed at the time of Tisha B'Av. They were not killed at the time of the Chorban Beis HaMikdash. The answer is, says the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah, Lilamedcha, Sheshkula Misas Tzadikim Kisrefas Beis Alekeinu. It's to teach that the death of Tzadikim is like the burning of the Beis HaMikdash. And a person has to realize that every God will be Yisrael. A Talmud Chacham is like a Beis HaMikdash. So recently, Klai Yisrael suffered the, the passing of a great tzaddik and Makobal and B'nai Brak, Rav Sroya Devlitsky, a person should feel when they hear about the death of a tzaddik that they're experiencing Chorben. The kino begins, Arze Halavanoin, Cedars of the Lebanon, Adirei Atoira, Mighty Warriors of Toira, Balei Tracen, Shield Bearers, the Mishnah of the Gemara, Giboyre Koyach, mighty warriors, Amaleha B'Tahara, who toil with purity. You see, learning Torah is different than every other intellectual pursuit. I remember in Yeshiva, you know exactly who's going to be successful in a discipline. If you're smart, you'll be successful. That's all it's dependent on. But not so Limit Torah. Limit Torah is not dependent on intellectual acumen. For Limit Torah, you need Siata Deshmaya. And for Siata Deshmaya, you need Amelos, Amoleha, and it has to be with Yerushamayim, the Tahara. The Kino goes on to depict how they bring in Rav Shem and Gamliel and Rav Shmuel Kohen Gadol. And each beg the executioner, please take me so that I don't have to bear to see the death of my colleague. And the executioner was so overwhelmed by the love that they had to each other that the executioner decided to cast lots. If you look on line 10, Yadu Goiro, Mirisha, and Lacherev, Berura, they cast lots to see who would be put to death by the sword first. 
Kinefal Goyral, our Rabbin Shimon, Pashat Savara, Yuvacha, Kinek Zura When the lot fell out on Rab Shimon, he stretched out his neck and he cried when the decree was issued. Rab Shimon Gamliel was the Nasi, he was the great grandson of Hillel and was a direct descendant of David Amelech. Says the Mishnah Brura on Simon Nun Gimel, in the name of the Sefer Chasidim. Then when Rav Shimon Gamliel was being taken out to be murdered, he turns to Rav Shmuel Kayin God, he says, I don't understand, why am I being murdered like a criminal? I never did an Avera. And Rav Shmuel said, maybe one time, when you were teaching Torah Barabim, your heart felt personal pleasure. You felt covered, and you benefited improperly from the Torah. And Reb Shimon said, Achi nicham tani. My brother, you comforted me. On the bottom line, Yisera Aroin, from the descendants of Aroin, Shal b'vakasha, Livkois, al ben ha-gevira. Reb Shmuel Kayin Gadol requested to cry over the son of royalty, Reb Shimon. Not al roisha yunasona yal akuboisav, he took the severed head of Rab Shimon and he put it on his lap. And he cried out, Menoira hatahira, O pure Menoira, some enov al enov, upiv al piv, viava gemura. He put his eyes on his eyes and his mouth on his mouth in complete love. Anavi Amar, Pam is Gaber Batoira. How could it be that this mouth that was so Strong and so powerful in Torah, Pisaim Niknas Alav, Misa Meshuna Vachamura. The Mekayne then relates that they ordered to turn to Abishmal Kain Gadal and they severed the skin of his head with a sharp razor. And they're skinning off the skin of his head. And he didn't make a sound. He didn't make a sound. We could explain that based on the Tashbates who has a tradition from the Marami Rotenberg that if a person is Moshe Nefesh Al-Kiddush Hashem, they don't feel the pain. But the Mekoinen says, Russia, when the wicked man ha poshet es, he gialim koim tefillin mitzvah zbara. When he got to his makoim at tefillin, tzak tzaka, he let out a cry, even his daza oilam, and the world trembled, v'yeretz his poira. Rabbi Shmuel was able to contain his own personal tsar, but the pain of never again being able to put on the tefillin shabaroish, that was too much pain to bear. The Mekoinen continues, Me'achrov hevius Rabbi Akiva. Then they bring out the great Tana Rabbi Akiva, says the Mekoinen, Oikar harem v'toychanan zoi b'zu b'svar Rabbi Akiva, whose penetrating analysis could literally uproot mountains. And he combed his flesh with iron combs to break him. His soul left saying, The Echad of Shema. His Talmidim said, Rabbi Akiva, you're, you could even say Shema. You could even love HaKadosh Baruch at a time like this. Rabbi Akiva said, How could I not? Now that it has come to my hands, I should not fulfill it. This has a very important meaning, la halacha. There's a halacha that I think is overlooked, and it's a fundamental halacha in Judaism. And that is, when we say Shema, the Mishnabura brings down, one should think and imagine that they're experiencing all the Misa is Bezdin for the sake of HaKadosh Baruch that during Shema, one should be mechavin, that they're being moiser, nefesh, al-kiddush Hashem. It's a halacha. That's Kabbalah, salmach, shamayim. That when you say Shema, you imagine yourself in a fire, being moiser, nefesh, al-kiddush baruch. That's pshat, says Rabbi Akiva. My whole life, whenever I said Shema, I was mechavin to be moiser, nefesh. And now that I can be moiser, nefesh, I'm not going to do it. Says Yushalmi, the Baskal cried out, Ashrecha Rabbi Akiva, Gufcha Tar Tahara. During World War I, Rabbi David Pavarsky was on the run. The only way he could save himself was to go into an outhouse. 
he chose not to. Somehow he was saved. They came to him and they said, Rebbe, why didn't you run into the bathroom? You're mechuyiv to do whatever you can to save your life. Why didn't you run into the bathroom? Says Rebbe David Pavarsky, because a Yid dies by saying Shema Yisrael. How could I run into the base Hakise? I would not be able to die like a Yid with Shema Yisrael on my lips. Every year one of my Rabbim, Rav Rabbi Obam Shlita, would say, says over the following Megala Amukais. Megala Amukais says like this, Why did Rabbi Akiva suffer the worst fate of all the Asura Rugi Malchus? Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar brings down in Parshas Vayigash, and we mention it on Yom Kippur, that the Asura Harugi Malchus were a tikkun, were a kapara, and a gilgal. They were gilgulim of the ten shvatim that sold Yosef. Which one of the shvatim was most responsible for selling Yosef? Shimon. Rabbi Akiva was the gilgal of Shimon. Therefore, Rabbi Akiva suffered the worst fate of all these ten sadikim. Says Megala Mukais. His yard side, I believe, is Yud Gimel Av. Megala Mukais had Giloi Eliyahu Panim El Panim. Says Megala Mukais, there was a Tana by the name of Shimon Ho'am Sunni. Shimon Ho'am Sunni darshaned every S in the Torah. Beresh Yisrael came S Hashemayim L'Rabbais. V'yes Ha'aretz L'Rabbais. He was able to understand what the word S comes to include until he got to the Pasuk, S Hashem Elikech Atira, fear God, who else in this world do you need to fear besides God? You can't include anybody else with God. And therefore, Shimon Ham Sunni said, It's been a nice career. I hereby retract every drusha I ever gave in my life. Pretty courageous. Imagine, all those shiurim said they're all wrong. Ad Shaba Rabbi Akiva! Until Rabbi Akiva got up, Es l'rabois talmidei chachamim. That the same way you need to fear God, you need to fear talmidei chachamim. Rabbi Kiva was darshan es. When Yosef had Shimon in prison, if he would have killed him, there never would have been a Rabbi Kiva. The fact that he let him out of jail meant Shimon still needs to be punished, so there will be a Rabbi Kiva. So what does the Pasuk say when, Sh- when Yosef let Shimon out of jail? Vayoytze aleyem S. Shemayin. That who did he let out of jail with Shemayin? He let out the S, the ability to darshan the S, which is the drasha of Rabbi Akiva. Maybe we could add to the Megala Amukais. So if Rabbi Akiva's drasha is, what is the first message that Yosef gives his brothers? S. Hashem Ani I fear God. But S, I also fear Tamide Chachamim. Kina. Uh, most English kinos uh, say that the first kinah that speaks about a tragedy other than the Holocaust is kina chafhei. But Rav Salvechik argues very strongly and rather correctly that this kinah, in fact, is the first one that commemorates a tragedy other than the Chorban. Reading the, caref- the kinah very carefully, one, one uncovers that this is a commemoration of the massacre of the Kehilois Shum. Shum stands for Shpires, Varmaiza, and Mainz. If you look in the Tanoim, the early Tanoim, written before Rav Moshe's Tanoim, it says the Tanoim of Kehilois Shum. Reading this kinah in this light, one particular line comes to light. Look on page 258 on the ninth line. It says, Mi yafli nezirois u mi who now will interpret the intricacies of Nazirus, and who now will interpret Nadarim? What a strange question. Who will interpret Nazirus? Not so many people are zoicha to learn Nazirus. That's what we're upset about. That with the destruction of these communities, we're not going to learn Masech the Nazir. Nazir is for the greatest of Tamid Chachamim. It's not even Nagea Lamaisa, Nadarim. Why doesn't, it, why doesn't it say, who will explain to us Shabbos, Chulin? Why Nazirus? Says Rav Salavechik, brilliantly, there are two Masechtas in Shas that are very difficult, but do not have Rashi. Although there is a commentary on the side of the page of Nazir that purports to be Rashi, it's not Rashi. What the Mekoinen is saying is that with the destruction of German Jewry, all the Balei Hatoisis were killed. 
Rashi was not Zoicha, did not have time to write on the Sechta Nazir. Had the Balei Toysas not been killed, we would have had a, a, a Rishon who could write on the Sechta Nazir, the Sechta Nadarim. But now, with, because of the Crusades and the destruction of the Balei Toysas, Mi Yafli Nazirus, Umi Aroch Nadarim, who can explain these difficult tractates? Kina Chav Gimel, Vias Nove Chatasi Hishmima. This kinna laments a tragic story in Gittin Nun Ches, Eicha Rabbah, Parsha Aleph Oiz Chav Beis, of the son and daughter of Rabbi Shmuel Kohen Gadol. We just spoke about Rabbi Shmuel Kohen Gadol, how his skin was flayed. Rabbi Shmuel Kohen Gadol was an exceptionally handsome man. In the Yela Eskara that we say on Yom Kippur, it says the daughter of the emperor wanted to preserve his skin so that she could gaze at his beauty. He was extraordinarily handsome. And his son was equally handsome and his daughter equally beautiful. And they were taken captive by different Roman owners. The two slave owners got together and they figured if they're Meshadach, this beautiful boy with this strikingly beautiful woman, they would produce the most exquisite and talented slaves on the trade market. They did not know that they were brother and sister. If you look... In the kina, v'ho adoyna mi bachutz libam ke'achad. The monster, the masters waited outside. Page two sixty. They could not see each other. Top of the page, v'heim boichim b'mar nefesh v'fachad. But the son and daughter of Rishmal Kohen Gadol, they cried bitterly. Ad boiker bechisa mohedmima. Their cries did not silent until the morning. Zayisboid bechel of a kerelev yimse. He mourned. A tremble inside his heart was melting. Nin aroin ech l'shivcha yehi noise. A scion of aroin. Can he be wed to a maidservant? What do we learn from here? What was the argument that he gave himself not to violate his sanctity? Not that God is going to punish him. But how could he defile his own personal greatness? Rabbeinu Yoyna writes that the first step in Avodah Hashem is to realize one's own value. If somebody doesn't appreciate the worth of their mitzvahs, the worth of their Torah, then it's easy to throw in the towel. The greatest safeguard to stay on the right path is realize your yichos. Realize where you come from, that you're B'nai Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. He said, how can a scion of Aaron HaKoyen defile himself? And in the morning, she likewise said, how could the daughter of Yochever be wed to a slave? In the morning when they recognized each other, Woe brother, woe sister! They intensified their cries. V'nezdabku yachad v'nezchabru. They embraced each other and cleaved. Ad yatsasa nishmasam b'neshima. Until their souls departed in anguish. And the kina ends. L'zois yikoinein yirmiyahu b'she'iyah. This is what Yirmiyah lamented. A reference to the Gemara that when Yirmiyah said... He refers to the son and daughter of Rabbi Shemal Kain Gadam. Rabbi Soloveitchik uncovers a beautiful gem from this kina. Until now, we're speaking about the collective mourning of Klai Yisrael. Chor ben Beis HaMikdash. The death of millions. And all of a sudden now, we start, we highlight a particular incident of a boy and a girl. In the scheme of things, in relative to the major national catastrophe, it would pale in comparison. Rabbi Shmuel Chaim Gadol, their father, was long dead. Here you have a Yasem and Almana, nothing's going to come of them anyway. In the scheme of Jewish history, in the midst of commemorating Chorben Beis HaMikdash, why focus on the death of two individuals? Says Rav Salavechik, we learn from here that Judaism has a different approach to the individual. We mourn every individual, even if they're not a leader, even if they're not a tzaddik, even if they didn't play a major role. You know, in light of major catastrophe, who is responsible to remember the nameless, faceless, 
tragedies of Jewish history, who is responsible to remember them? We are. We have to remember every individual. It's not enough to remember the major disasters, Churban Beis Hamikdash. We have to commemorate the death of every Yachid as if it was all of Klal Yisrael. Their death may not have changed the face of Jewish history, but we never forget the faceless, nameless individual in the midst of national disaster. This is the important lesson of this kina. Nothing is overshadowed. Since Rav Salvechik, there's an additional pedagogical lesson and psychological reason that we bring in this particular kina. And that is, people do not have an emotional response to major catastrophe. You tell somebody, six million Jews died in the Holocaust. And they can listen to it stone-hearted. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's human nature. Says Rav Soloveitchik, A tragedy of great proportion is very difficult to comprehend. The Medrash says in Parshas Noyach, Rabbi Akiva was collecting money for Aniyim. He went to the city of Ginzik, so he wanted to make a good pitch. So he says, Rabbi Sai, if you don't give tzedakah, you know the mabul wiped out mankind. Eh. No reaction. Then Rabbi Akiva told the tragic story of Eiv, and the people broke down crying. That is because it is easier for a person to be moved with, by the story of the individual than by the story of the deaths of tens of thousands. So my dear friend Rabbi Shlomo Margarefta told me a few years ago, that the Ramami Pano explains that this episode of the son and daughter of Rabbi Shmuel Kain Gadol, where they were able to overcome the temptation, they were the Gogulim of Amnon and Tamar, and they were Masakain, the episode of Amnon and Tamar. Kina Chav Gimel. Kina Chav Dalad. Try to bring out from Kina Chav Dalad a very fundamental concept, because this is the first time we don't discuss just the Beis HaMikdash itself, but we're focusing on the desecration of the Kalim of the Beis HaMikdash, and I think it's important for us to be in touch with what do the Kalim of the Beis HaMikdash mean to us. We say, al Khurban Beis HaMikdash, Kihuras V'chihudash, Esboid B'chol Shana V'shana Misbeid Chadash. That every year we're going to give a new morning, what does that mean we're going to give a new morning? You know, there's considerable discussion in Halacha whether the Avelos of Tisha B'av is as Chamor as the Avelos for a relative. Because after all, you can make the argument the Avelos of a relative is what is called Avelos Chadasha. It's new news. It's something fresh. The wounds are open. As opposed to Churban Beis HaMikdash, it's an alta story. It's an old story. Maybe it's more lenient. That's a, a very big discussion in Halacha. But what the Kino says is no. Espoid b'choshana v'shana mispeid chadash. You can't say I said this last year. I did this last year. Every year it has to be felt as if this is a new morning, as if the wounds are still open. Ala koidesh says the Kino of Yal Hamikdash. Not just for the Beis Hamikdash itself, but for the Kalim as well. So I want to discuss a very important Indian, a very fundamental Indian. You know, halachas of major significance in the Torah are sometimes learned out of only one pasuk, sometimes one word, and sometimes even one letter. And yet there is one topic in the Torah that clearly outsurpasses, in terms of the real estate that it occupies, any subject in the Torah. What topic does the Torah speak about more, by far, more than any other subject in the Torah? The Mishkan and its appurtenances. Well, as we know, the famous rule, location, 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 if the Mishkan occupies more real estate and God's property than any other subject, clearly this is what is foremost on the mind of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. After all, the Torah is the mind of Hashem. What then is so important about the Mishkan? Who cares what the dimensions of the Mishkan are? Most people don't even know the dimensions of their own house or their own dining room table let alone measure it every year. And if you measure your dining room table every year, I have someone who you could speak to. And yet every year we read in the Torah the dimensions of the Aroin, the Shulchan, the Menorah, the Mizbeach. Who cares? Of what significance is it? 
Imagine if you had somebody every year he took out the architectural plans of his house. Nobody does that. Nobody normal does that. Why do we read the dimensions of the Mishkan every single year? The key to understanding this question is a Pasuk in Parshas Chuma. The Rebbe Nishom tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Kechoyal Asher Ani Mare Oischa, in accordance with everything that I show you. Hashem doesn't say, Kechoyal Asher Ani Mare Licha, that I'm showing it to you, but rather, Kechoyal Asher Ani Mare Oischa, in accordance with what, which I show you. Is Hashem showing Moshe, Moshe? Hashem showing Moshe the Mishkan. It should say, "Kachal Asher Ani Mara Lecha." There's a sefer attributed to the Rambam, which is uh, completely unknown. The name of the sefer is Perkei Hahatzlacha. The Kuzari Rabbi Yudal Levi writes the same thing. Further elaborated by Rabbi Shua Heller, the Chayson Yeshuais, and that is there's a very basic concept in Jewish thought, and that is the Mikdash and the Mishkan is a microcosm of man. The Mishkan is literally an illustration and a mashal to a human being. And therefore, the holiest area of the Mishkan could be broken up into three parts. You have the Kodesh HaKadoshim, you have the Kodesh, and you have the Chatzar. In the Kodesh HaKadoshim, you have the Arayin and the Kruvim. In the Kodesh, you have the Menoira, the Shulchan, and the Mizbeach HaKetoras. And in the Chatzar, you have the Mizbeach HaOila. Well, says Rabbi Shua Heller, the three parts of the Mishkan correspond to the three parts of the Jewish face. The, ho- the greatest part of the face, the holiest part of the face, is the forehead. That is why on the forehead, the forehead is the Kodesh HaKadoshim. That is why the Kain Gadol would wear the tzitz that said Kodesh Lashem on the forehead. Says the Zayar HaKadosh and the Idra Rabba and the Idra Zuta, how many chambers of the brain are there? We hope. Chachma, Bina, Vadas. That corresponds to the three chambers of the human mind, represented by the Aroin and the two Kruvim. The Aroin is only a marshal to the Kedusha of the mind. The mind is holier than the Aroin, the Aroin is just the marshal. That's why you have to be so careful what you think about. To bring an improper thought into the mind is bringing something improper into the Kodesh HaKadoshim. What a frightening thought. Says Rabbi Shua Heller, When we realize the mind is literally the Kodesh HaKadoshim, is greater than the Kodesh HaKadoshim. We move down a little further. The next part of the face, the eyes and the nose. That's the Kodesh. The eyes is the Menorah, and the Shulchan, the nose is in the Zbeach HaKetoras, Yasimu Ketoras Biapecha, you smell the Rech Nichaycha the Ketoras. This is Mavur in the Gemara. The Gemara in Yuma Lamed Gimel Amad Beis asks, we know the Mizbeach has to be right in between the Menorah and the Shulchan, but it can't interrupt, it has to be Mashuch Kima. Frek the Gemara, put the Mizbeach HaKetoras right in between the Menorah and the Shulchan. No, Ki Hechi Delechzi Ahadadi the Menorah and the Shulchan need to look at each other. They're the two eyes. How careful we have to be what we look at with our eyes. Would somebody bring a screen or a magazine into the Kodesh? How could somebody look at it? Defile the clay HaMikdash. We move further down. The mouth is the Mizbeach HaOila. The burning of Karbanos is called Achilas HaMizbeach. When a person eats, they have to realize that the hakravas hakarbanes was only a me'ain, is only a detail, is only a semblance of the kedusha of the mouth. And incredibly, says Rabbi Shua Heller, if you count up all the appurtenances of the Mishkan, 48 krashim, 100 adonim, 10 yuriyos, 100 lulais, 50 krasim, 11 yuriyos izim, 100 lulais, 50 krasim, 15 brichim, 96 tabais, the menorah, the kruvim, the shulchan, the zechoilim, the zechaktaris, the kiar, the five vavim, the five adonim, the five amudim, and the mesach, 613. To indicate 
that just like the human being has 248 limbs and 365 sinews, they are represented by the Mishkan. The Kedusha of the Mishkan is just a marshal to recognize the sanctity that a Jew is able to elevate himself to. How important it is to guard one's mouth. Would somebody bring a Davar Tame on the Mizbeach? Would somebody say, well, I'll bring something on the Menorah. It's only a commercial. A person would have Yiras Ha'oinesh Vaharoimimos with what they would bring next to the Menorah. The Menorah is nothing compared to the Kedusha of the Ayin. The Mishkan is not a house. The Mishkan is an insight into the Kedusha of an Adam. Says Rebbeinu Shalom to Moshe, Kachal Asher Ani Mare Oischa. By showing you the Mishkan, I'm showing you you. Says Rebbeinu Shalom. The topic that occupies the most space in the Torah is the Mishkan, because what is most dear to me and is what is most sanctified to me, and what is most important to me is you. The Mishkan is a description of the Adam. Well, friends, let's think about the following. What then does it mean if the Beis HaMikdash and the Mishkan is destroyed? What does it mean about us? If the Mishkan is us and the Mishkan is destroyed, what does that say about us? That means we are Bechorbana. That means the Neshama is Bechorbana. That we have been destroyed. And in that case, if we see as the years go by, how the society at large is plummeting lower and lower in darkness and immorality. That means our own personal chorba needs to intensify and get stronger every year. And that is why it is this kina that mourns the mikdash and the mishkan, meaning that mourns us, brings out this idea that aspid b'chol shana v'shana misbeid chadash, that every year we're able to feel new feelings of mourning. Kina chavdalad. Kina lamed vav tziyayin halaysi shali. The kina begins the last group of kinas for Tisha B'av. The kinas ends with ten piyutim that are known as the tziyayin kinas, all with the exception of one, begin with the word tziyayin. They're all concerned with the fact that Eretz Yisrael is the center of the universe. Kina lamed vav was written by Yehuda HaLevi, one of the greatest of all the paitanim. Yehuda HaLevi was born in 1080 in Toledo, Spain. The Rajba says in Shuvah Taf Yerches, the Rehud Levi was the greatest of all the Paitanim. Aside from studying Talmud, Rehud Levi became a master of literary style and Hebrew and Arabic grammar. Rehud Levi was literally in love with the land of Israel. Wasn't he the one who cited, invoked the famous words, Libi b'Mizrach v'ani b'Saif Ma'arav? My heart is in the east, while I am stranded in the farthest end of the west. There have been many pilgrims to the land of Israel. Many Gedolim have gone to the land of Israel. But no one ever expressed their love for Eretz Yisrael like Rabbi Huda Levi. The Rambam, for example, in Mar Nevuchim, only mentions Eretz Yisrael one time. Chavis Havavos does not mention Eretz Yisrael in the entire Sefer. Even the Ramban, who is a great lover of Eretz Yisrael, only speaks about Eretz Yisrael in the halachic sense. Rabbi Huda Levi, however, expressed his love and his passion in a very poetic and literary style. Rabbi Huda Levi says, Mi yasali knafayim ve'archik nedoid. Huda Levi says, Who will make me wings so that I might wander far away? Anid levisrei levavi, cause my shattered heart to wander, bein besaroyach amidst your ruins. What does Rabbi Huda Levi refer to when he says, could somebody make him wings? So I could fly among the ruins of Eretz Yisrael. I believe Rabbi Huda Levi is echoing the, the desire of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu and Dvarim Rabbah on this week's parsha. Hashem says, Moshe, go up to the town to the ma- top of the mountain. V'sham re'i siha, v'sham aloi savoy. You could look at Eretz Yisrael, but you won't go in. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, if I can't go in, let me go in like an animal, like a chaya, like a cow. Rebbeinu Shalom said, Rav Lach. Omar lefana Rebbeinu Shalom v'imlav 
Let me just fly into Eretz Yisrael like a bird. So we see that Moshe Rabbeinu desire that if he can't go into Israel, at least let him fly through it. Ask Reb Moshe, in the Darash Moshe, the Gemara and Saita Yedalit says, Lainasavim Moshe, Moshe only wanted to go into Eretz Yisrael to Mekaye, Mitzvah Yitzhatzli Yois, Ba'aretz. As a bird, there are no mitzvahs that Moshe Rabbeinu could do in Eretz Yisrael. Why then, what would the tachlis be of entering Eretz Yisrael as a bird? The answer is, says Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi, Apel la'ape alei artzeich. If only I could fall on my face on your soil, meaning just to breathe the air of Eretz Yisrael, it's worthwhile, all the trials, all the tribulations, merely to inhale the, the air of Eretz Yisrael. The Artsa Avonech Lamoid, I would intensely cherish your stones. And favor your dust. Referring to Rab Abba, Rab Abba's custom was when he would enter Eretz Yisrael, he would kiss the dirt, the stones of Eretz Yisrael. In this week's parasha, Parshas Vaschana and Moshe Rabbeinu's Mespalel, Ebrona, the Eres Haaretz HaToiva. Says the Paneach Roza, one of the masters of the secrets of the Torah, the Yardin is 50 Amos wide. But Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, Ebrona, let me go into Eretz Yisrael, just one Amma. If I could just put my feet down on one Amma of Eretz Yisrael, it's worthwhile. What gives the dirt of Eretz Yisrael their Kedusha? An astounding thing, look on the fourth line. Af ki ba'amdi alei kivrois avoisai. Page 330. When I stood on the graves of my forefathers, ve'ashtoimim alei chevroin mivchar kvoroyach. I was astonished about chevron, the choicest of your burial spots. Har ho'avorim, har nevoi, asher sham urim gedoylem o'irayach o'irayach. Rabbi Yudah Levi is enunciating the principle that the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael emanates from the tzaddikim that are buried in the dirt of Eretz Yisrael. The fact that we have these great luminaries, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, even Moshe and Aaron, even the Jordan is part of Eretz Yisrael, that imbues Eretz Yisrael with tremendous Kedusha. In Sefer Nehemiah, we find this principle enunciated as well. The king of Yisha, the king of Paras, turns to Nehemiah. He says, "Why are you so forlorn? Why are you so despondent? Listen to the words that Nehemiah says. He doesn't say the base Hamikdash is destroyed. He says, "Madua lo yero panai asher ho'ira base kivroi savoi sai chareva. If the city where my forefathers are buried is destroyed, how could I be in comfort? Meaning the kedusha of Yushalayim." in a certain sense, is infused by all the G'dayli Yisrael buried there. And then Rabbi Huda Alevi pens perhaps his most stirring words. Chaye neshamois avir artzeich. The life of the soul is the air of your land. That merely breathing in the air of Eretz Yisrael gives the neshama life-giving properties and spiritual existence. The idea that Eretz Yisrael sustains the soul is enunciated by the Kuzari in very great detail, says the Kuzari. Just as the guf needs oxygen, the soul needs oxygen of Eretz Yisrael to survive. A soul that doesn't breathe in the air of Eretz Yisrael is choking, is gasping. The atmosphere of Eretz Yisrael is infused with Ruach HaKodesh. Says the grandfather of the Chida, Rabbi Avram Azulai, had the privilege to be at his kever this year in Hebron. He writes in the Chesed Li Avram, Avir Eretz Yisrael, Hu Tahar Hamucham Lektushel Vavoydas Hashem. That's why we call it Avira. Avira is a compound word. Avir Yud, the, the light of God. The light of God is in the air of Eretz Yisrael. That's why Chazal say, Avira Da'ara Machkim. Chazanish commented that 1933 when he went to Eretz Yisrael, his learning was elevated to a new level. He had extra siyata d'shmaya. Says Rabbi Huda Halevi, and perhaps his greatest contribution to Klal Yisrael was his Kuzari. In the Kuzari he describes the quest of the king of the Khazar tribe to determine the true religion. He gathers a Christian scholar, a Muslim scholar, a Jewish scholar, 
And finally, the king is convinced of the authenticity of the Torah, but he says there's one thing about the Jewish people with it, which is hypocri- hypocritical. He says, you daven three times a day, and you don't want to go to Tzion. If you wanted to go to Tzion, you wouldn't spend so much money on your homes. If you wanted to go to Tzion, then why do you have such nice possessions? You don't care about Tzion. Ein diburenu el of hazarzir. You mutter and shatter the words of prayer like a bird. She'ein anachnu choyshu amashenemar. You don't even think about what you're saying. Says the Kuzari. You know why Mashiach has not come? Because we don't want him to come. We would like him not to come. Says the Kuzari, if you build a nice home, you're saying, this is my home. Says the Kuzari, v'mayinu mezamnim atzmeinu l'kras alakei avoseinu, hayinu poige mimenu mashapagu avoseinu v'matzrayim. If we would want him to come, then he would come. Why doesn't he come? Because we told him to get lost, and we're not interested in him coming. And the Kuzari took these words to heart. He left the Gullus. Legend has it, upon reaching to Damascus, facing Tzion, he said this, Kina. Many historians believe that Rabbi Huda Halevi died in Damascus, but there is a tradition quoted in the Shashas HaKabbalah. That Rabbi Huda Halevi reached Yushalayim, he rolled in the dirt, he rolled in the dust, in fulfillment of Kiratsu Avadecha Savaneha. He was then trampled and killed by an Arab horseman. Kina Lamed Vav Tzion HaLei You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.